matter our calling in life, it is ours because of Jesus Christ. And in his name, we begin with a prayer. Lord, as we meditate on your word today, may you fill us with peace and remind us that the confidence that we have is in you, in you alone, just as we sang in our hymn. Bless us and our meditation of your word and fill our hearts with your spirit. I'm not sure if any of you have heard the story I'm about to share, but it's one that is uh, deeply meaningful to Alicia and I, having lived through it. But back in 2009, when we were living in Alberta, we were serving a, a small, we were serving a congregation in Red Deer, but we were also serving part-time this church called St. John's Wetaskiwin, Alberta. It's kind of halfway between Red Deer and Edmonton area, little town, old congregation, and at that time, kind of dwindling and aging, it was getting smaller and smaller. So the people were faithful and they wanted to come and worship and they loved their congregation and their church and their building. But one night, the fall of 2009, this man went to a different church in the city and burned it down, committed arson. This town was shocked, the community was surprised. But then the next night, he did it to St. John's, to our congregation. He broke into the library and started a fire. Fortunately, God be praised, there was a mother nursing her baby at three in the morning, and she saw flames coming out of the church window, phoned 911, and the fire department was still watching the smoldering ruins of the other church so they raced over and were able to douse the building with water and put the fire out. That said, when we went inside the building and heard the sad news, a building that looked kind of like ours on the inside, all the beams, the ceiling was all charred, and everything was sopping wet from all the, the water that the fire department had poured in to put the fire out. Even the cross in the front was hard up of it, up it all black. Everyone was devastated. You could imagine what the mood might have been like the following Sunday. Pastor Dan Hobbin, who was serving that church with me, kind of each of us helping out part time, invited all the people there, and the mood was down. People thought, this is it. This is the end of our church. We just lost our building. And they also found out in those days in between, their insurance wasn't going to cover enough to even, to even rebuild it if they had to tear it down. There just wasn't enough money. It was in that moment that you have to ask this question, who are we? That we can even keep our church open, that we can keep going with this sad situation. Pastor Hobbin gave all the people a chance to say what was on their mind, and there was a lot of tears and a lot of just sadness poured out. Now, today, we're, we're kind of putting ourselves into a, the, this time in life when we can, we can either feel really down or the opposite, being so confident of how everything is going great, because sometimes we can go from one to the other very quickly. And we find Moses is the story we're talking about here, and Peter kind of on opposite ends of that spectrum. Peter saying to Jesus, you know, Jesus, even if I have to die, I will never, I will never deny you. I'll never forsake you. And then you heard what happened in the gospel reading. On the other hand, we have Moses. Moses is the most famous prophet in the Old Testament who boldly led the people through the Red Sea and brought the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai, but the Moses we see in the story today doesn't sound like that Moses. He just spent 40 years hiding from the Egyptians, tending sheep in the wilderness, in the desert. And then God comes to him, changes everything. Moses sees, you heard in this story, a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. It's a strange sight, he calls it, and he wants to see what it is. And so God comes to him really to rescue his people, but also to rescue Moses and to rescue us 
when we are relying too much on our own confidence, whether that's low or high. And that's what we see. We're going to start kind of in the middle of the story. If you're reading along, it starts at verse 7 in the middle. You follow along in your bulletin. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, Moses, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This is a turning point in Moses' life. God is literally talking to him from a bush. Something that no one else in recorded history in the Bible has a similar experience like Moses is having right here. In God's plan, he lays it out to Moses. I am calling you. I am sending you to rescue my people from slavery in Egypt, Moses. This is going to be a big thing. And I am sending you. All of us, as Christians, we can say have callings from God. We use terms like calling or vocation to describe God using us in our own lives to his own glory and to serving him. But we can't say the way Moses could say that we were called in this way and in such a dramatic and in a big way to rescue a whole nation of people from slavery and lead them through a desert to the promised land. That's a big deal that Moses is called to do this. And so it's not surprising that Moses would say, Lord, who am I that I should go? Seems humble and meek that Moses is saying, God, I'm, not, I'm just not worthy of this. Who am I? But as I kind of mentioned in the children's message and, and introducing that, uh, the lesson, God offers him reason after reason. And if you keep reading this story, Moses keeps objecting time and time again. Well, you know, God, um, I can't talk. I'm not very good at public speaking, so I can't do it. God says, I'm going to send your brother Aaron to be your mouth. Well, how will they know it's from me? And it's, it's really from you. I, who am I? Well, I'm going to let you do some miracles here. and Powerful signs that will show the Egyptians that I am the Lord. And finally, Moses says, God, just please send someone else. Not me. And suddenly we realize that when Moses is saying, who am I? What he's really saying is, I have a lot of doubts, not just about my ability, but that even if you're with me, God, that is going to be enough to do this enormous task that you have called me to do. Now think about who Moses is talking to. One thing if you say, who am I to people like us, but Moses is talking to God, the very God who made him and created him and who equipped him for this job. And Moses was uniquely equipped. He grew up in Pharaoh's house. They rescued him and out of the Nile, out of the basket, that Moses could grow up as an Egyptian, getting all of this training and education and learning about what it means to rule a nation, to rule a nation of people like the Israelites. And then after he fled Egypt, after murdering the Egyptian, he spent 40 years in the desert, in the wilderness, taking care of sheep. Maybe he learned a thing or two about wilderness survival in the desert. I mean, who is better equipped to lead God's people than someone with all of this experience like Moses? And yet he is saying to the God who made him and equipped him, who am I, God, who am I that I can do this? It sounds humble sort of. But what it really is, is Moses is saying, I know better, God. There's just no way I can do this. 
it ceases to be humility, starts to be doubting, lacking trust in God himself. It's pretty easy for us to do that. We see Peter doing that too. Although his, his on the other side of the spectrum when he shows up, God, Jesus, I'm never going to deny you. But we heard exactly what happened three times. Denied even knowing Jesus to his shame. We're obviously not called to lead God's people out of slavery, nor to be Jesus' disciple and to stand in the garden courtyard with him. But that doesn't mean we don't have callings. We do. In fact, the scriptures are very clear about this. Paul has a really powerful verse on this in Ephesians 2. He says, God has equipped us as well. He says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's Ephesians 2 verse 10. God calls us. God equips us with tasks that he has in mind since before he even made the world just for you to do. That your upbringing, your background, your personality, your spiritual gifts, all of these things contribute to equipping you to do the tasks that God has assigned to you. They can be daunting. They can be scary. We might even say to God, who am I? to do this task you've laid before me. I heard an example of that this week about a young Christian girl made a mistake. Then, now she's pregnant. Her pastor was asking our study group, what should I do? How can I help her? Because on the one hand, she sees this calling from God to care for this child who is now going to be a part of her life, though she's not old enough, mature enough, or financially stable enough to do anything with that. And yet, people around her, her society, they're pushing her, just get rid of it. It's overwhelming. Who am I to care for this child, she asked. Think about responsibility that we may have in life care for people, like a family member, aging parents? Who am I that I can offer this care to someone else in a moment of need, but who knows them better than you to care for those family members? Maybe learning a new language. You probably face this every day. You're trying to struggle through how to speak in English or to learn something else. And who are we? Who am I? I, I, I? It's easy to chicken out and say, oh, I can't practice that. I don't know how to say those. There's lots of ways where we are called, and we might ask, oh, I can't do that. Who am I? And certainly on that day in Wetasco, when, when all the people were gathered, that was exactly what we were thinking. Who are we that we can even continue one more day as a church? We just lost our building, and all our spirits are crushed. The Lord got very frustrated with Moses in this story. And he gets a stern lecture as you keep reading towards the end of chapter 3 and into chapter 4 because Moses was talking to the Lord, his God, who made him and who was equipping him and was going to go with him to accomplish this great rescue of his people. And the point of all of this that the Lord is trying to make to Moses is stop asking about or thinking about yourself, Moses. This isn't about you. It's not about me or any of us. It's about God. About who he is. Because that is the solution that God lays out for Moses. God said, when Moses says, who am I? His response is really powerful. He says, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, uh, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. 
This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. The Lord's solution to Moses is not try harder, looking deep inside of yourself and pull yourself up by your bootstraps or something like that, or just believe. None of that. God's answer is him, himself. Whatever the call, whatever the situation, whatever the task, I know how great that task appears, the solution is not in me or in you, it's in God, because he is God. He is the Lord, who is. Who is and who was before all of this world existed that we live in, he is the Lord who says, I am who I am. He is the Lord who reminds Moses in this moment about those patriarchs, those famous believers before him, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am their God too. And Jesus later reminds us that they are alive. And when God says this, I am the God of these men, saying, I am the God who kept my promise to them. I'm going to keep my promise to you as well. In other words, whatever our situation, no matter how daunting it may feel, the tasks that God sets before us, the callings he gives us, the spot we find ourselves, the vocation we live in. The answer is not me or in you or in ourselves. Because our confidence can go from feeling down, who are we, to feeling overconfident and then stumbling like Peter in a flash. No, our confidence must be in God and in the Savior that he sent. When Peter denied Jesus, when his overconfidence and self-reliance failed him, the story says that he went out and wept bitterly, but before Jesus looked at it. That's what Luke tells us. Jesus looked directly at Peter. In the moment of Peter's weakness, Jesus was the one looking at him. And that look said it all. It was a call of repentance, but it was also a call of love. Say, Peter, you failed. My love is still for you. And I am standing here to take that sin to the cross. This makes our solution even stronger because the text that we were reading here in in Exodus chapter 3, where God is saying his great name to us, I am who I am, who always is and was and will be. Beginning of the text, this little detail stands out. It says, there the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the flames of fire from within the bush. When we read the Old Testament and hear this story about the angel of the Lord, he appears from time to time, Old Testament. It's actually the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus before he was Jesus, before he took on our human nature. It's not actually an angel at all. It's God who appeared to Moses in the bush to say, I am who I am. And it's this same Jesus who stood before the Jews and said, before Abraham was born, I am. The same Jesus who wants us to see that our confidence and our solution is not in ourselves, but in him who went before the Jews and the the court and never wavered. Did a perfect job. And then went and gave his life for us. It's this same Jesus who says, I am who I am, who came to forgive Peter's sin when he denied him after he rose from the dead and called Peter in repentance and restored him and went with the people of Israel and with Moses through the sea, through the desert for all the 40 years that came after this. And it's this same Jesus, this same Lord who still calls us weak, Feeble, frail, yes. Lacking confidence at times and overconfident at other times. 
Jesus is the one who calls us to carry out tasks that we would consider impossible to do on our own, but with him, all things are possible. That service in Wetaskiwin, St. John's, everyone was there feeling terribly sad. They had lost their church. I choked up if I tell you this part. There was a little boy, eight-year-old boy named Josiah, who was there that day. He stood up in front of the congregation. Everyone got a chance to say what they needed to say. He said, I'm really angry at what this man did to our church, burning it down. I don't want him to win. I don't want the devil to win. We have God on earth. He had this box that he made at home and decorated with paper, uh, and he cut a hole in the top. And he told the story of King Joash in the Old Testament who had set a similar box out before the people when they needed to repair the temple in Jerusalem. And this eight-year-old boy sets this box out in front of our whole church and puts his own loony, his own dollar, into the box and says, this is how we're going to rebuild our church. He saved it. God rescued the people that day through an eight-year-old boy, reminding us that our confidence is not in ourselves. We're not rescued by, by our own strength. We are rescued by the Lord, the gracious God who is, I am. Amen. Please stand.